Well, I'm really very honored to be at this meeting with such a distinguished group of people. What I'm going to try and do here is discuss why the lattice is, in fact, a very important tool for understanding quantized Yang-Mills theory. So as we all know, <coughs> the Yang-Mills gluons are, in, in the current picture, the fields that hold the quarks together. Uh, they're very, very much like electric fields superficially, except for a few couple of differences. One, there are eight of them, not the one of photon. And so they're non-abelian. And the non-abelian nature means that they're actually charged. They're charged particles, uh, uh, but they start off massless. That's the main topic of this meeting. And of course, I'm interested in QCD, which brings the quarks into the game. These are the fundamental constituents, feeling the nuclear force, that we know there are six, these six of them. There's the up, down, strange, charm, bottom, and top quarks. And out of these, we construct our physical particles. The proton is two U's and a D, and the neutron is a U and two D's. Now, why are we so convinced that these quarks exist? Well, first of all, they originally came from the fact that different combinations of the quarks could give large families of observed particles. That's the famous eightfold way. Then there's the high energy scattering experiments at SLAC, which suggests there really is something point like inside the proton. Uh, and then in the mid 70s, the, the uh, heavy quark bound states were found, such as the J, which is a bound, a bound state of a charm quark and an anti charm quark. And these really are the hydrogen atoms of quarks. And so at, at, at this point in time, we really knew they had to be there. Now, <clears throat> there's this issue of confinement. Quarks have never been seen isolated from each other. Uh, and it's related somehow to the fact that the, the gluon, because the gluons self-interact, they're, they're charged with respect to each other, uh, and a massless gluon would be like having a massless charged particle, and you wonder what, where's the energy in the charge field around it, etc. So what's believed happens is that the gluon flux lines coming out of a quark do not uh, spread out in a 1 over r squared way, but instead form these flux tubes, which uh, David talked about yesterday. Uh, and so the, the picture is that there's like a string connecting the quark with the anti-quark. Uh, the reason you can't have an isolated quark is the same as the reason you can't have a string with only one end. Of course, there's a slight issue there. How can you have a string with three ends for the proton? But that comes from the group theory. And this string is very strong. It's uh, in physical units 14 tons of tension holding the quarks together. So you're not going to be able to get them apart. Okay. <clears throat> now, the lattice approach takes the idea of the, these quarks and gluons and cuts the theory off by putting this theory on a lattice. Uh, so we're going to replace any uh, world line with a set of hops between nearest neighbor sites. And this is a four-dimensional lattice because we're going to put time and space together. Now, the important thing to realize is that this lattice is really nothing but a mathematical trick. Uh, <clears throat> I did the same thing everybody else does. Uh, we need, at the end of the theory, to take the lattice spacing to zero to get real physics. You should think of the lattice spacing as some kind of a cutoff on the field theory, some minimum length. Uh, in length, it's, you know, it's one over pi over some scale, momentum scale. And what does this do for us? Well, it does two things. First of all, it provides a definition of a quantum field theory as a limiting process. The quantum field theory is the limit as A goes to zero of this theory as you adjust the appropriate parameters. And the other thing it does for us, it, we, we turn the theory into basically a bunch of integrals, and then you can put these on the computer, and it allows numerical computations. So what I want to do now is sort of go through some of the history of what led us to this approach. What, what is, why did we come to this crazy lattice approach to studying yang mills theories? And so I'm going to start back when I was a graduate student. Uh, and at that time, well, quantum electrodynamics had been around for a while. It was immensely successful, but generally regarded as pretty much finished. This was a period of the uh, Eightfold Way, which started suggesting there were quarks. The electroweak theory was just emerging. Uh, 
the electron proton scattering had indicated there was something point like in the in the uh, proton. Although at that time people were very reluctant to identify the quarks with the protons. But one thing which was very clear at the time was that meson nucleon perturbation theory was just failing. The effective coupling between a pion and a proton is a number which is much larger than one in comparison with the electromagnetic coupling in electrodynamics, dynamics, which is 1 over 137. So there was no small parameter for expansion. So a lot of particle theorists, or at least field theorists, got very, very frustrated. And this was the time when S-matrix theory was very popular. The idea is that the particles are not themselves elementary, but they're all bound states of each other. The proton and a pion can bind together to form a delta, or the delta and a pion can bind together to form a proton. And everything was held together by exchanging themselves. This actually lies at the roots of duality and uh, product between particles and forces, and this eventually led to what we call string theory today. And it was an interesting time because it was not at all obvious what does one mean by an elementary particle. Now, as we go into the 70s, the partons began to be more and more identified with the quarks. Uh, and this was the time when the renormalizability of the non abelian gauge interaction was demonstrated, uh, which Joseph and Bellman got the prize for in 99. It was also the time that asymptotic freedom was discovered, and David here was involved with that, with Pauliche and Wilczek. And so this theory, this QCD, this quark confining dynamics, <coughs> was beginning to evolve. Uh, but there was still the question of this confinement issue. Uh, the things we see in the laboratory are the interacting hadrons. These quarks and gluons you don't see in the laboratory, so how can they really be regarded as elementary? So this question is still around. What is elementary? Uh, in the mid-70s was a real exciting time in particle physics. First of all, the JSI was discovered, and then that really convinced people that quarks really did exist. Field theory was being reborn. This became the standard model, which hasn't really changed very much since then. Uh, but there's some, also some exciting things going on in other, in, in whoops, I'm going to get this, uh, in field theory at the same time. Uh, it was discovered there were other ways to get particles than just have your, your elementary fields you put into per perturbation theory. There were, there were these things called solitons uh, that were a new way to get particles. And in, these, these were examples were all in two dimensions, but you could discover two different field theories, which, which looked very, very different, were actually equivalent. And this was also a time of growing connections with statistical mechanics. And back with, because you have two field theories which have the same physics, we're back to this question, what is elementary? But what we began to realize is that field theory was really more than just Feynman diagrams. In fact, now we actually know of examples of field theories with different physics but identical perturbative expansions. So that's really quite remarkable. Okay, now in field theory, at least is usually formulated, has some of these infinities. Uh, the bare charge and the mass are, are both divergent quantities, and you have to regulate them somehow for calculations. But most of the regulators we're familiar with, poly, large, dimensional regularization, are perturbative. They're based on Feynman diagrams. You start calculating a diagram, you find an infinity, and you cut it off. Uh, and of course, perturbation theory is an expansion in some small parameter. Uh, but this expansion misses many important non-perturbative effects, such as confinement. The whole issue of parallel symmetry breaking is very hidden in perturbation theory. Uh, and there's no parameter, small parameter to expand in. So we really need some kind of non-perturbative regulator for the theory. This is where Wilson comes in. He, he first of all formulated this theory in this, the QCD in the strong coupling limit on the lattice, and he demonstrated in the strong coupling limit that quarks really were confined. They can only travel around as bound states of each other. And what the lattice provides us with is a non-perturbative cutoff. You cut off the theory before you've done any perturbative expansion. So to repeat myself, lattice gauge theory is a mathematical trick. It introduces a minimum wavelength or lattice spacing, a, a lattice spacing that corresponds to a maximum momentum. It does allow computations, which is a very nice thing. 
And most, one of the most important things is it actually provides a way to define the field theory. So we should be discreet and do it on a lattice. The nice things about giving old talks, I could use old jokes. <laughs> On the other hand, there are a lot of people that say you should be indiscreet and do it continuously. But at least you can spell discrete differently. OK, so Wilson's formulation is actually very elegant. It, it incorporates directly some of the very nice properties of gauge theories. First of all, it maintains a local symmetry. And it also writes the theory as a theory of phases, that as a particle moves around in a, in a gauge field, it its wave function will pick up a phase, and that's directly formulated in the Wilson approach on the lattice. So the idea is that when a quark hops from one side to another, its wave function will pick up a phase, which is related to the exponential of the integral of the amu along that link. Now for the QCD, these of course are not ordinary phases. They're three by three unitary matrices, elements of SU3. Uh, but they're located on all the links connecting the nearest neighbors in the lattice. And the three is associated with the fact that you've got to have three quarks in the proton. Now, those are the variables. Uh, for some dynamics, you want something which looks like F mu, F mu. And Wilson said the elegant way to do this is to look at plaquettes, look at elementary squares. And if you multiply the links around an elementary square, this is very much like a curl. You're calculating the flux through that square. Uh, and so this is a natural thing to use to formulate your action. So the, the action of the angles theory, e squared plus b squared, gets replaced with a sum over all the elementary squares. There's a 1 minus a third to trace the plaquette, so this will vanish when all the links are 1. Okay, so we have our variables. We have an action. Now we want to do quantum mechanics. And lattice theory, gauge theory does quantum mechanics by the Feynman path integral. But the sum of our paths in the field theory becomes the sum over all the possible variables in the theory. In this case, it's the sum over all possible values for the phases. So this path of the uh, theory is reduced to calculating something like a partition function, which is the integral over all the links, e to the minus beta times the action. Uh, What's nice about this formulation is that these, these U's are all groups of uh, elements of the SU3 group, and there's a very natural measure for in group theory. So we just use the invariant group measure. And this coefficient of beta here is related to the bare charge of the theory. <coughs> that, uh, and the usual relation of beta is 6 over the, bare, the usually normalized bare charge cup squared. Now, field theory has divergences, so we have to renormalize the coupling constant as the lattice spacing goes to zero. And the idea is to hold, adjust this parameter beta as you vary the lattice spacing to hold some physical quantity constant. So that's the normal. Uh, now, it's very interesting to think about the parameters of this theory, and I think David certainly mentioned this yesterday. Uh, because of asymptotic freedom, we know, actually know what this coupling constant is supposed to do in the continuum limit. It's supposed to go to zero logarithmically uh, as a goes to zero. And of course, to go to zero logarithmically, you've got to introduce a scale. And the scale is parameter is well, called lambda QCD. But the idea is that you replace the coupling constant with a scale. The scale is uh, given a marvelous name by Bowman and Weinberg, dimensional transmutation. But of course, the value of any dimensional scale depends on the units you use. I could measure it in miles. I could measure it in um, MEV. Uh, so it's not really a parameter. So after you've gotten rid of the coupling constants of scale, the only parameters remaining are the quark masses. So this is a very uh, elegant theory in the sense it doesn't have a coupling constant. It's, uh, only, the only parameters are the quark masses. Uh, and an interesting limit to consider is the masses quark limit. Uh, in this limit, we believe the pion mass will become zero because of parallel symmetry. But in this limit, everything is, else is determined. So the ratio of the rho mass to the proton mass should be determined in this theory with nothing to vary. And this is a, a cute limit because it's not that far from reality. The, the pion is quite a lot lighter than the proton. 
but this is an extremely elegant. We have a, a quantum field theory with no parameters. Okay, now <clears throat> this brings us to numerical simulation. Uh, what, what we've done is we've written the uh, partition function as an integral uh, over a bunch of group elements. It's just an ordinary integral, so let's go off and do it. Well, that gets a little tricky because say we have a 10 to the fourth lattice. This is the 10 to the fourth times four directions times eight variables for each SU3 element, a 320,000 dimensional integral. Uh, and so if I even just took two points in each dimension, I've got two to the 320,000 terms to add up, which is multiplied out, uh, 10 to the 96,329 terms. Now the age of the universe is only 10 to the 27 nanoseconds, so you really can't do this. But this suggests that maybe you should do something uh, statistical when you get such huge numbers. And if you think about a statistical system you're used to, for instance, a glass of beer, there are many, many places you can put the molecules of the hydrogen and the oxygen and a little bit of nitrogen, and it would still be a glass of beer. And if you want to know all the important properties of beer, you only need about six glasses. So that's the idea. We're going to try and take, think of z as being like a partition function, which it formally looks like, and this coupling constant is related to the temperature. And so we want to find typical equilibrium configurations of this statistical system. And to do that, we use a markup process. We, take, we want to generate configurations with a probability weighted by the action. And we do this by making a bunch of changes in some sort of a random way. And I won't go into the details of how that works. No, no I'll do a little bit. I'll, let me give you an example. Uh, this was an a, a example we worked out very early in the game with Jacobs and Remy. Uh, supposing the links just took two values, and let's say just plus or minus one. Well, what you could do is you could calculate the, cal the probability of some particular link has, has value one, which is either minus beta at the action at one, and normalized, and you take a random number, you divide this, this roulette wheel into two sections, one proportional to probability one, one to minus one, you let it spin, and you replace the link with the new value. Now you can generalize this to, <coughs> to SU3 group elements too, it's not terribly difficult. Uh, the idea is we make random field changes, biased by the Boltzmann weight, in such a way that you converge towards uh, thermal mm -hmm. equilibrium. Now this is very seductive uh, because you've got the whole vacuum there in your pocket. Uh, <clears throat> so in principle you can measure anything. Of course, that's uh, it, it, there are going to be errors in this process, but it's a new thing for theoretical physicists to have error bars. And there are lots of sources of error. First of all, we, you can't really work on an infinite lattice, you have to make it finite. <clears throat> You have to keep the lattice spacing finite because uh, there will be too many points. Uh, it turns out that things converge very slowly if the quarks get very, very light. That's partly because the pion becomes massless. And so to get to physical masses, we, do, we usually have to do quark mass extrapolations, although the latest simulations are getting around this now. So here's just an, an old example. Uh, you can measure the force between two quarks if you pull them apart, and you can see that in fact it does go to a constant at large distances. This is the distance, this is the force. And so you, you see confinement in these simulations very, very early. There are three different values here corresponding to three different values. The lattice spacing, and you see that things all scale together, which is very nice. Now, when, one thing you can try and do is calculate the particle masses. And that's done by inserting into our partition function some operator which can create the particle you're looking at. And so if you measure the correlation between two of these operators separated by some distance, this should fall off exponentially with the mass of, the, of the, that particular particle. Uh, in this game, the bare quark mass is a parameter, which we adjust in order to get the pion mass right. Uh, you can go to the for the kaon, you would use the kaon to get the strange quark mass. But once you pick the, the, the quark masses to get the, a few things right, everything else is determined. And so David showed a much more modern version of this picture. This is one that came out a few years ago. Uh, and generally, it, uh, 
agrees. It, well, the two of these things are inputs. The pi is an input, the k is an input, uh, and we get the perspective very nicely. And of course, this is getting better with time. Uh, you can ask questions about particles we haven't seen yet, really, at least not clearly. Uh, this was a paper from Morningstar in Puritan a few years ago, uh, trying to measure the gluon, bound states of the gluon. So this is done without any dynamical quarks. So they've only looked at the gluon fields alone, but they find various states. Uh, but this is, this is done without the quark pairs. There is a, when you put the quarks in, there's an issue of mixing between the quark states and the glue states, which gets very complicated. OK, I think we actually have time to do this. Uh, another very big industry in the, in the lattice game is, is studying the quark gluon plasma. plasma. The, the question of what happens to the vacuum when you make it hot. Now, first, that sounds like a crazy thing to do, because the vacuum doesn't have anything in it. But that's not true. If you took a box. Uh, and, and started heating up the walls, what will happen is the balls will get red hot and will start getting photons inside that box. <clears throat> and then as you make it hotter and hotter and hotter, you'll start, these photons will collide and create hadrons. And so at very high temperatures, you can study high, high, very high temperatures by putting the theory into a finite box, using the fact that the partition function is related to either minus the Hamiltonian times time, that is the physical partition function, and you can study what happens. And what has been observed is that confinement is lost at very high temperatures. Chiral symmetry gets restored. There's a very rapid change in behavior around 170 to 190 MeV. Now, it turns out this is not a two transition, but actually a very rapid crossover. But, it's, but it is really quite dramatic. This is uh, there's a big jump in the entropy of the system as you vary the temperature. Uh, this particular graph is done with a non-regress approximation to QCD. It's not quite the right thing, but uh, it, it's, it's really quite dramatic. Okay, so I'm going to close with just mentioning a few unsolved issues. Uh, one of the most pressing one to me, anyway, is chiral gauge theories. The things like the strong interactions are in very good shape. Uh, we understand how to formulate this QCD on, on the lattice. But we know that there are particles out there which couple in chiral manners, such as the neutrinos. We do not have a lattice formulation of chiral gauge theories yet. Uh, now, since I've been emphasizing that the lattice is a way to define a field theory, uh, this means we do not have a non-perturbative definition of the weak interactions. I find that very distressing. Maybe there's something we don't understand here. Then there's some more practical problem, a lot of interesting physics occurs in situations where the path integral is not over real numbers, but involves uh, uh, complex numbers. It, the most interesting there is the fact that when you take the, uh, a very large baryon density in, in nuclear matter, are there weird phases, like these color superconductive phases at very high density? We don't have any way to do that on the lattice yet. And then. I think this question still remains in some extent. What really is the elementary thing? And uh, I'd say there's still lots of room for new ideas. And that's what I have to say. Uh,